Hello, and welcome to episode seven of A Pod About a Pod, a podcast about podcasts featuring commentary, critique, and sneak peeks of a different show every episode in my bi-weekly quest to share the best of podcasts. I'm your host, Jordan Pierce, and today we're taking a deep dive into an extremely entertaining journalistic podcast that explores the complexities and realities of queer identities and experiences just in time for Pride Month. Now, I know that was quite a mouthful, and that's because Podcast X, also known as Nancy, covers a wide breadth of topics and conversations. Throughout this episode and every episode, I will refer to the specific show being featured for the day as Podcast X. So, now that we know that Pod X is Nancy, I want to acknowledge real quick that this episode was delayed one week from when it was initially slated to drop. That's for a couple different reasons. The first being that my sister is moving to Los Angeles and I wanted to soak up as much quality time with her as possible before she left. The other reason pertains to the unchecked systemic racism and police brutality that has been happening in my country, the USA, since our inception. I'm talking about the national response to George Floyd's recent and unnecessary death, and in the wake of losing Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, and far too many others. So let me be clear, Black Lives Matter. And with efforts such as Blackout Tuesday going on with social media to uplift Black voices over this past week and all of the coverage around the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests and riots being organized, I decided to delay this episode so those more relevant content creators could use the platform space to be heard and so I could take some time to listen and to learn, which is an ongoing process. So that being said, I'm also recognizing that this catalog I'm building with a pod about a pod needs multicultural diversification. And if there's a podcast you love that's hosted by a person of color, please send it my way at a pod about a pod at gmail.com. Today's pod X is hosted by two Asian American content creators who also happen to be queer. And the protests and riots happening now can't help but call to mind the Stonewall riots, which were so pivotal to the LGBT plus rights movement. Stay tuned for the peanut gallery at the end of this episode, where my friend Beth and I get into a deeper conversation about those topics. As always, at the top of the episode, we'll begin with what to expect. Nancy is honestly so entertaining that, it, I mean, it is a journalistic podcast, and that's why I decided to describe it as such. But the stories are so heartfelt, authentic, and relevant, and they have to do with identity as well as society, with a variety of underrepresented and intersectional queer voices coming to the table and participating in these conversations. So it's something really special going on between the journalistic integrity and the inter personal vulnerability that is happening in this show. The topics range from queer history, queer politics, religion, health, finance, sports, any like denomination you could think of in subject or genre, they've probably tackled it in one way, shape, or form. One thing that I want to say about the content in terms of a disclaimer is there's adult content. It's an LGBT centric podcast. And so that infers conversations about sex, gender and sexuality. So coming up is a little taste of exactly what I mean in terms of what to expect with reference to the LGBT adult content. It's all in good fun and it's all for the purposes of education and entertainment. It's just something to keep in mind if you want to listen with kids or, uh, you know, if you're sensitive to subject matters of that sort. This first sneak peek is from an episode entitled Investigations, and it was from the beginning of last month, the beginning of May, so a recent episode, and it features an exploration into the history of glory holes and their cultural significance for gay men in particular. So sorry, mom and dad, uh, if you want to skip ahead for the next 220 seconds, that is fine. The rest of you, get ready to learn yourself a thing or two about the history and cultural significance of glory holes. First documented case of a glory hole was in 1707. 
Wow, we were both so wrong. There was a court case uh, called The Trials of Thomas Vaughn and Thomas Davis. <gasps> Yes. Two Thomases. Two Thomases, because I guess it was, you know, 1707 England. <laughs> so like everyone was names. <laughs> Thomas. There's a transcript of a court case between the two Thomases. Here's an excerpt from the court document. Keep in mind, this is from 1707. And it starts with Thomas number one. He, having had occasion to go to the borough of Southwark to a customer of his about some business, in his return took water and landed at the temple stairs. But, having occasion to untruss a point, went down to the temple bog house. Thomas number one had to pee, so he went to this public bathroom called the temple bog house where he had not been long before a boy in the adjoining vault put his pretty member through a hole. And Thomas number two in the next stall put his dick through a hole in stall door. Which he, perceiving, was so surprised that he immediately went away. And the first guy, Thomas number one, was like, ah, what the fuck, and left. But he was no sooner come out but the boy followed him and cried out, stop him, saying he would have buggered him. And the guy who pulled his dick out, Thomas number two, followed Thomas number one out of the bathroom and shouted for help, claiming that Thomas number one was trying to have sex with him. So it was a trap? How did you understand that from all of that yes you're exactly right no no <laughs> hold on hold on what i don't understand what is happening so the guy who stuck his dick through the hole was blackmailing the guy with the full bladder but the guy who just wanted to pee was like um what you're doing is extortion that's super illegal so i'm gonna take you to court so they go to court with extortion charges and buggery charges which is gay sex and that's how we have a court record of this first ever documented glory hall. Wow. The legal proceedings. I know. They were thorough in 1707. Seriously, yeah. So the reason this glory hole was even documented in the first place came out of the fact that at this point in England, sex between men was illegal, even punishable by death. <laughs> And, you know, laws prohibiting sodomy persisted up until modern times. Like, it took until 2003 for the U.S. Supreme Court to ban anti-sodomy laws. And despite this, some states still have anti-sodomy laws on the books. So glory holes have always played a part in men finding each other while keeping their identities safe. So there was this sort of network and this, these messages being left about where to go. You could go to these glory halls and people would write on the walls and like Sharpie, um, you know, be here at this time or, you know, hot action here from, you know, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. on Thursday or whatever. There would also be notes like heads up, police are patrolling it or whatever. So watch out. And Dr. White says that feeling is what defines glory holes the most, the finding each other. So first off, how fun was that voice talent and the sound design with the flashback, you know, back in the day to ye old first glory hole. We also got to hear from an expert in their field. So that's something to expect from this podcast is interviews from experts in the field, famous celebrity icons, as well as real queer folks who are friends of the show or other everyday LGBT plus people live in their lives. One other thing that I love about Nancy, they're not afraid to deliver hard-hitting yet balanced journalism around controversial subjects like the nuances of gay Republicans or kids who do drag. Friends of APAAP know that our second segment on the show is Quick History. So let's start with how our co-hosts of Nancy met, which was when they both attended a small audio program hosted twice a year in Cape Cod called the Transom Story Workshop. With alumni at Spotify, the New York Times, and the Washington Post, among others, it seems like an excellent opportunity for an aspiring podcaster, and I got to do some additional research into that myself. 
After this transom story workshop, the co-hosts went their separate ways and returned to their lives, although keeping in contact online. When WNYC Studios held a podcast accelerator contest, the creators of Nancy beat more than 400 other applicants to get the opportunity to join WNYC Studios. Which, like, if you're a young podcaster or a little show, that's like the dream. Real quick, thanks to Thomas Curry of and Other for writing Nancy, the duo who brought queer storytelling to the podcast realm. That was a extremely helpful article for me as I was preparing for this episode. And another fun fact I was super jazzed to learn about the history of Nancy is the pilot for the show they put together in September of 2015, and the first episode wasn't actually premiered until April 9th of 2017. That means they had like two years in between when they pitched this episode and when they debuted it to the world. And I just feel like the time that they took to intentionally craft their own origin story really shines through because the very first episode that is on Nancy's catalog is called Hello Hello and it recounts the coming out stories of both of the co-hosts and I just feel like that's a very thoughtful way to kick off a very thoughtful podcast and I can't think of another evergreen podcast that has the same amount of thoughtfulness about their origin story and their structure their storytelling structure <laughs> We are back with the third segment of our show, Meet the Talent. So we already heard about the origin story of the Nancy podcast, and I talked a little bit about how the co-hosts met. I did want to mention that on the Nancy website, they have a what they call Meet the Hosts starter kit, which I've never seen yet on a website for a podcast, but it's really neat. It basically has specific playlists that they've curated for uh, certain things, and one of them is Meet the Hosts. So the episodes that they have specified on that playlist, should you be curious to listen to episodes that will allow you to meet the talent and get to know them more, they suggest Hello, Hello, the swimsuit issue, and five simple steps. So we're going to begin getting to know the lady co-host, Kathy Tu. You are going to get to hear your first or second sneak peek, excuse me, and it's from Five Simple Steps. I love Taiwan. I was born there. I spent the first four years of my life there. Growing up, I went back frequently with my family to visit. I love the people. I love the scooters. I love the public transit. And I love the food. Oh my god, I love the food so much. Beef noodle soup, mian xian, bubble tea, stinky tofu, Taiwanese desserts. I just love it all. It's also the place where I discovered I was queer. I spent a semester in college learning Mandarin in Taiwan and fell in love with a teacher. Nothing ever happened, but that really was the beginning of me figuring out my queerness. So when this happened... Celebrations broke out across Taiwan this week as a court ruling paved the way to the first same-sex marriage law in Asia. I was beside myself. Last year, Taiwan's highest court ruled that same-sex marriage is legal under its constitution, even though no laws currently allow it. And it gave the legislature two years to change the law. And if they don't, then the Taiwanese government would just have to start issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. So basically, same-sex marriage is very likely happening. It's just not official yet. This news made some sense because Taiwan is maybe the most queer-friendly country in Asia. It has the continent's largest pride parade, more than 120,000 people last year. No Asian country has legalized same-sex marriage, and protections for LGBTQ folks are pretty rare. And for a long time, Taiwan barely had any protections either. When I studied there a decade ago, queerness wasn't very visible. And it definitely wasn't when my mom was growing up in Taiwan. She grew up believing in a nuclear family with a mom and a dad and kids, and falling outside of the norm is bad and shameful. If you heard the show before, you've probably heard her say that. I've tried coming out to my mom multiple times, and it never seems to go very well. We struggle because of the language barrier, but even more so, we have a cultural barrier. She wants me to be happy, but my being queer makes her unhappy, and she'll say it's fine, but she'll also ask why I have to be this way and look this way. 
Again, that sneak peek was from Five Simple Steps, and I highly recommend giving that episode a whole listen from start to finish. It's fascinating. You get to hear from Kathy's mom and her thought process and just the influence of her Chinese culture and the way that she feels and thinks. And it just, I don't know, for me, was a total perspective shifter and eye-opener in terms of being on the other side of that conversation. I've come out to my parents before. I haven't had too many experiences of people like coming out to me. Well, I guess that's not true, but I feel like when you're a parent, it's definitely different. And depending on how you were raised and your background, then it's a different conversation too. Kathy's previous work on podcasts include Masterpiece Studio, The Memory Palace, Radio Lab. The Mortified Podcast, and The West Wing Weekly. A couple other fun facts I was able to gather. She doesn't know how to swim. She loves backpacks and productivity apps. Same. I need to pick your brain on what apps you're using, Kathy, because I'm kind of disenchanted with mine at the moment, but I love me a productivity app. And she has a dog named Bowie, who has his own Instagram. And now, the gentleman host, Tobin Lowe. He recently became a dog owner as well with a pup named Arlene. Isn't it so charming when people name their pets with like these eloquent human names? Hilarious. Tobin's family is from China and he came out as gay over Thanksgiving break during his freshman year in college. Let's hear a quick cute story from little baby Tobin, Tobin's childhood, and we'll pick back up after. So when I was in the sixth grade, I would say I was a very serious poet. Sixth grade poet, okay. <laughs> I thought that I had discovered my medium, like this is how I was going to express myself to the world. Okay. So of course, when a poetry contest was announced at school, I was like, this is it. You entered. And of course, I won. Of course, naturally. you won. <laughs> so my parents drive me to the local Barnes & Noble where the award ceremony is being held. And we walk into what I would say is a stage full of five and six year olds <laughs> reading limericks about friendship <laughs> and it's immediately clear oh no this is a contest where everybody won <laughs> i am not special oh Tobin. i know and it wouldn't have been a problem if i hadn't been going through my dark phase an emo phase an emo phase exactly it's that phase where everyone thinks that in order to be serious and important, you have to be as dark as possible. Okay. So the poem I had written was about a heartless CEO of a company who accidentally shoots his only friend in the world, a dog, on a hunting trip. <laughs> oh, man. It was very dark. So sad. And when my parents read it, they were like, is this a cry for help? And I was like, no, I'm a serious poet. <laughs> So they drive me to this award ceremony. We're standing there in front of all the five and six year olds and we look at each other and I'm like, we got to get out of here. <laughs> oh, so you did not scar people. Of course I'm not going to read that poem I in mean, front of six year olds. Uh... Well, yeah. The moral of the story really is that poetry is powerful. Okay. You know, it's like a powerful thing. Sure. As someone who's currently pursuing a bachelor's degree in literature and writing studies, let me concur that poetry is powerful. Tobin's previous work includes serving as a producer on the first season of More Perfect. His work has also appeared on Marketplace, Studio 360, and the Codebreaker podcast. Also, I want to shout out to the executive producer, Susie Lechtenberg, and the producer, sound designer, Jeremy S. Bloom. Both of them also do a lot of hard work for the show, and I'm sure it's a team effort to pull off a podcast as polished as Nancy. All right, we have officially reached the meat of our multi-layered sandwich of a show, Yitz Wit, also known as Why It's Worth It. Let me break it down for you. The personal vulnerability of the hosts and the guests to share their coming out stories and their real life experiences of trauma and harassment persecution, discrimination. It takes a lot of bravery and courage. It's hard to find journalists who are able to tap into that and are willing to go to those places themselves, which both of these co-hosts are able to do. And they bring on a plethora of people with all of these perspectives who are somehow willing to go to that place. And that's something special. 
this journalistic integrity whilst interviewing friends and families about these LGBT issues is also something that shouldn't be understated. Again, these are sort of controversial, sensitive subjects that, you know, for lack of better words, sometimes you might be walking on eggshells. So how do you conduct an interview while maintaining, you know, the respect of yourself and the respect of the person you're interviewing and not stepping on any toes? These folks managed to do it and make it look easy. Juxtaposed with these informed opinions are perspectives of people just from the street. I like to think of this as the cis heteronormative society slice of their point of view. And it lends to a more cohesive context. It paints a bigger picture for our society that's less black and white and a little bit more Fifty Shades of Grey. Again, if you want to check out the Nancy website, they have a curated playlist called Why Listeners Love Nancy Starter Kit that would probably give you, you know, their best evidence on why they would say they're worth the listen. And the episodes featured on that playlist include My Brother and Me, It's Really You, and Return to the Ring of Keys. And that last one is especially interesting. It's about uh, a woman named Sarah Lou. We go back to her childhood when she got her first glimpse at life as a queer adult when she visited a woman named Mora's general store. Years later, Sarah tracks down Mora to have a conversation with her role model. And it's just a really great example of why I think Nancy is worth it because Nancy is a platform for the kinds of stories and perspectives that I didn't hear growing up. And and would have been very helpful for me and hopeful for me to hear. I mean, there was queer TV to watch and queer books to read, but in terms of like real life experience and real life stories and the reality of moving through the world as a queer person, I didn't hear those kinds of stories. And that's what Nancy has to offer. Your next sneak peek is right around the corner. I wanted to give a quick bit of context. This episode is called When They Win, and it is discussing transgender athletes competing at the high school level. So we're going to listen in and we'll chat about it afterward. I mean, a lot of the criticism that is leveled against Andrea is that, you know, her running isn't fair. I hate that word sometimes. Mm. Why do you hate that word? Fair is it's about context, right? It's about how you look at the situation. And I think that usage of the word fair is very one-sided on their end. You know, you don't want her to run, right? I mean, this is what she does to, you know, to enjoy and to be who she wants to be. Is that fair and does not allow her to do that? Because you allow your child to do that. Why can't my child do that? So this, the term fair, I think, is subjective. It's very subjective. Benghazi has three other kids, all with different activities, but she goes to as many of Andrea's track meets as possible. She wants Andrea to know that she's got support. I, I try to be with her as much as possible, like right next to her. There's often times if there's a clear path, I'm running with her. I'm running right down the sideline with her, especially when she's doing the 100 meter. And I might not make it to the end <laughs> as quickly as she does. And I'm loud and I'm emotional, but that's all that nervousness and all that, you know, kind of built up coming out through the race. Um, and it, it, to me, it's a very emotional moment, right? It's very emotional for her to do her races. Again, knowing that the world is watching in a sense and knowing that there's some that want to critique and criticize and, and say she shouldn't, um, but then also being elated and overjoyed that she did. We met up with Andrea at the Shoreline Championships. What did it feel like to win the 4 by one Nope, the 100 meter. That's what I wanted to ask you. Um, it felt really good. I think at the time that I won, so that's like, you know, upsetting. Mm. But I mean, I did so. I'm what did you run today? A 12.6. Time did you want? Like a 12, like a really low 12. <laughs> like a 12.2? Yeah. What do, you have to, what do you have to run to get a national? 12.0. <laughs> uh-huh. Like that's what you thought. Yeah. Not doing very good. <laughs> not not doing but good. And the last time I ran here, which was like two weeks ago, I got 12.3, so I don't know what's happening. Yep. 
A couple weeks after that meet, Andrea and Terry competed in the state open. But unlike in previous years, there weren't any major headlines about whether it was fair for them to compete. Because they didn't win. Uh, Terry was disqualified because of a false start, which happens to lots of athletes. And Andrea placed fourth in the state open. The times that we've seen Andrea and Terry get the most media coverage is when they've placed first and second in their respective races. And that didn't happen in the state open this year. And that's why we didn't see the coverage and the headlines that we'd seen in years previous. When transgender athletes lose, it doesn't fit the narrative that they are dominant and that they are stealing opportunities from cisgender girls. If an athlete who is trans is just like every other athlete that wins and loses sometimes, then how can you say that they are so dominant? And so when it doesn't fit the narrative, there isn't the coverage, there isn't the outrage, because there's nothing to be outraged about. But it creates this double-edged sword for these athletes where, you know, if they do win, it's not because they worked hard or because they are talented. It is because they are have an unfair advantage. And when they lose, there's no acknowledgement that they're just like everybody else. If you ask me, that is some A plus parenting. And good parenting or a loving support system can make the biggest difference growing up LGBT. And that's why I wanted to share that particular sneak peek, especially. Room for improvement. So far, I have been prattling on and on about the strengths of Nancy Podcast. And this is the segment of the show where I usually talk about the weaknesses or the suggestions I have, the areas for improvement. That being said, this episode is a little different for the fact that Nancy has not been renewed for another season and is actually premiering their last episode at the end of this month. June 29th of 2020 to be exact. It seems a little odd and pointless to suggest room for improvement for a show that uh, is going to be discontinued. Not to say that I won't cover, you know, limited series into the future, but it was just an odd place for me to find myself as I'm researching this show. And lo and behold, this article comes up and WNYC Studios did not renew them. As far as I could tell, it's for the fact that they weren't drumming up enough support. The show wasn't growing at the rate that, you know, these big studio, this big studio expected. So it's a bummer is what it is. And I don't really feel like trying to find things wrong with a show I love so much that wasn't renewed when it really should have been. Um, and if you can hear the bitterness in my voice, I, that is what it is. I am bitter about it. Not too much to say in terms of room for improvement. The only thing I might suggest um, for you, dear listener, and your listening experience, the show is very colorful and flavorful in terms of its audio design. There's a lot going on. And I would count that as a positive under most circumstances. For me, a lot of times when I'm listening to a podcast, I enjoy multitasking. And so I'm either doing sending emails, playing video games, cleaning, cooking, commuting. <laughs> so I, I'd like to do something while I'm listening to a podcast usually. And for this podcast, Nancy, there's so much going on. That sometimes it can kind of be overwhelming to multitask. So maybe give it your undivided attention if you have the opportunity. So not really a room for improvement, though. Just a little friendly pointer from me to you. Welcome to the peanut gallery, also known as the end of the show. I hope you have enjoyed learning more about the Nancy podcast and hearing these sneak peeks for our peanut gallery today. My friend Beth will be joining us. We met in college. She is a fellow theater kid and she also identifies as a lesbian. So for these reasons, I was like, you know what? I think Beth would get a kick out of Nancy. It's dramatic. It's fun. It's gay. So so <laughs> I sat down to chat with Beth over Zoom uh, to get technical, and let's hear what she thought of this podcast. 
Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Elizabeth Barron. Um, mostly people call me Beth. Um, I do a lot of theater work and um, I'm very into podcasts um, and activism and political um, conversations and um, social justice stuff. So I love podcasts that are queer, make me laugh, have political stances, and um, are educational. So uh, Jordan told me about Nancy and I've tried a couple episodes now and I love it. You mentioned that, yeah, this isn't like the only podcast you listen to or anything like that. So what kind of got you into podcasts like back in the day? Um, it was just to fill my time, really. Like I um, d travel so much for school. Uh, you know, I do like a 45 minute drive there and back. Um, and I was doing that quite a few days a week, especially with theater. And I just needed, you know, something to kind of like occupy my thoughts sometimes, you know, when you're an, um, an introspective person, you think too much a lot of the time. That's Absolutely. How I am. So I wanted it as I music wasn't doing it for me. And um, I quickly realized that, like, I really like listening to the podcast even to wake up. Um, it became kind of like a morning routine. I turned on my podcast and it made like my morning routine more fun getting ready. Yeah. And then I just kind of got addicted. <laughs> was there like a particular person who kind of told you about podcasts? Was there like a celebrity that you like that was like, oh, I have a podcast and that's how you like were introduced to the world? Or do you really remember how you like found out about podcasts? Yeah, it was Sophia Bush. Um, so she's like my favorite celebrity activist. I'm obsessed with her, follow her extremely closely. And she said that she was doing a work in progress, a podcast called Work in Progress, which is um, pretty similar to Nancy, I'd say. It's not queer per se, but it does have queer people on it as guests. Um, it's political, it's funny, it's educational. And so I started listening to that and I was like, I loved it. I mean, I just went through all of her stuff so quickly. And then I started off of that podcast, I started following other people who came to her interview. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I found my favorite TV shows from that podcast. I found my favorite um, political organizations from that podcast. I found wow. my favorite book that I've ever read from that podcast. So authors, comedians, my favorite new comedian. Like, um, So I was like, this is such a cool way to... Um, get news. Yeah. Um, and it's such a cool way to stay connected without like, you know, getting up in the morning and having to like scroll through a bunch of news feeds. Like this one seemed easier. <laughs> yeah. We've already been talking about it a little bit, but what did you think of Nancy? Oh, I loved it. It was so fun. Um, you, I think, told me to listen to the episode where they talk about the L word. Mm -hmm. I was cracking up. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, and I was even singing the theme song, you know? Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. I loved that they had yeah. the sound bites in there. Yeah. I was jamming. It was, I was like, and I mean, I've watched that show all the way through with every single one of my friends who's come out, which has been a lot. <laughs> That's <laughs> so like a ritual at that point. It, it is a ritual. I would say it's a lesbian thing if you haven't seen the L word. Like, it's a rite of initiation. <laughs> yes, it is. Like, it's just, you came out, okay, now you have to watch the soap opera that is the L word. Um... And I was definitely entertained by the fact that they were laughing at it because it it's a laughable show. It's so soap opera-y. It's, it's laughable once you um, have like the, the distance to like step back. I feel like if you're in the middle of season three, season four, yeah. and Dana's in the grips of her health crisis, I wouldn't have wanted to hear any of that. But Yeah, yeah. no, you can't laugh then. <laughs> I think another thing that the podcast did well that they did touch on was they were like, okay, so it was problematic at times, you know, their complete mistreatment of non-gender non binary people, um, trans people, there's so much lacking in like the cult, like, um, cult, it's not culturally diverse at all. Um, you know, the podcast was like, so since when is West LA like that white? It's not. Yeah, like what West Hollywood looks like. Yeah. That, that's not the demographic. That's of not the, the demographic. Like they're not. Oh, yeah. And it was kind of funny because I watched the new L word as well. Mm -hmm. And they just turned it around with um, the inclusiveness. Okay. So I've, I've cool. seen only the first episode of like the new L word. And it was because I went over to G's house and she has like, you know, the add on with uh, yeah. Showtime or whatever. So I haven't gotten to see it or, you know, any other episodes but besides that. But you're saying they do handle that better in terms of yeah. like the casting and the, you know, telling various stories from different populations. Nice. I was curious to see if the podcast was going to touch on that because it's been a really big conversation within the queer community that I've been following was, okay, yeah, we loved the show when it came out. 
um, it was the first time we all got to see ourselves on television and not as like the token lesbian. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it, you know, there was, there was butch phobia, there was biphobia, there was transphobia, you know, racial issues. And so it was like, I think it's really cool that there's now a new one coming out. It's the new generation mm-hmm. and the podcast, you know, like touched on that. I agree. Um, that's something I really appreciate in their journalistic style in general. Like, I feel like they do tend to give like a balanced perspective. As queer people, a lot of the time we are focused on how can we fit into this heteronormative society. Or for me as a trans person, for example, like passing used to be like the most important thing to me is like, how do I um, move about in this world in and be received the way I want to be received. And one interesting takeaway from one of the episodes was like, that society should actually be more like us. Like as queer people, you know, we have that inner conflict of like wanting to conform or like, you know, having the this external molds that we see and we're like okay we don't fit that but maybe you know the idea is that these molds are problematic you know we mm-hmm. need these queer individuals to kind of show why yeah the system doesn't work the system is broken like even for people who might fit neatly into these molds maybe these molds aren't working and you know they're outdated so i also just thought that that was a unique idea and message you don't hear very often i mean yeah tolerance is something you hear so much like oh yeah we need to tolerate queer people how about queer people are valuable to society we have stories worth telling that actually would benefit heteronormative society you know what i mean so again it's like you're saying it's not that you have to be gay to enjoy the podcast or that it's like preaching to straight people it's it's really none of that it's just that um you know our stories matter like and that not only do they matter because there are experiences and you know everyone's experiences matter they matter because um there's you know nuggets of value and wisdom that can benefit anybody yeah yeah exactly and i mean uh, I think the podcast does a great job of it making it like it's a queer space. It's it's a safe queer space. I mean, we're not going to dumb down our stories, our opinions, our, our experiences, but it's not preachy at all. Mm-hmm. And it's just it's almost like <laughs> it it's kind of like um, I guess to touch on stuff that's going on in the world now. It's like everybody is like um, I've heard a lot of my white friends be like I am scared to touch on the Black Lives Matter stuff that's going on because I don't want to say anything wrong (laughs) blah 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 Mm -hmm. and I was like just the minute you start listening to somebody else's stories it's like we have so much more like not in common because our experiences are different but it doesn't feel like you're listening to something that's like so outside or different if you're like oh i understand you You, that makes sense you're a person the common humanity yeah it's a common humanity that like the minute you just start listening you're like oh okay i'm you're we're not so different yeah i think that that's what happens when you have like a safe queer space like a podcast that just like if just go and listen and you're not going to feel like you're listening to maybe like a queer person talk that you can't relate to I have another segment of the podcast that's called Room for Improvement. And basically, I have that section because I don't want the whole episode to sound like a big infomercial or commercial for the episode I'm talking about, right? Or the show I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I'm showcasing it because I think it's excellent. And I want my friends and family and anybody else who cares to listen to enjoy it as much as I do. Uh, But that being said, was there any like suggestion you might have for something to change about the show? Feel free to like think about it for a second because I know I honestly this is going to be one of the shorter room for improvement sections I think on this episode because it's a very polished podcast like this not only is the journalism like very watertight and they have fact checkers etc like the sound design is also very um, engaging but yeah is there anything you might change about the show? So that one is hard because seriously, all aspects of it are even even down to like the the length of the episodes are. It's really there's not really a lot of fluff nice. or anything. Yeah, they're very no, concise. there isn't because yeah. Sometimes I find some podcasts unapproachable because they're they're so long, and this one's not like that. So um, you're right. This sounds good. I'd say maybe the intro. Sometimes um, I'm like, I can't. I don't understand what they'll be talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, now that's such a minor criticism. But sometimes I'm like, wait, so what are we covering this episode? Are we just kind of jumping around? Yeah. Um, So I guess people like me, like when I scroll through podcasts, I'm kind of looking for what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they cover a lot of stuff and I I can't quite put my finger on 
is this what I want to listen to or should I go on to another episode? That makes sense as well, in my opinion, because of how they title their episodes. I feel like you don't necessarily know, yeah, what the subject matter is that they're going to be talking about just by uh, the title name. Well, thank you, Beth, for joining me today. Did you have any final thoughts or feelings that you wanted to say either about the Nancy podcast or to anybody who's listening to my podcast? <laughs> um, uh, no, but, uh, well, okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I really like your idea of like a pod about a pod because um, I think I was overwhelmed when I first entered the world of podcasts. Um, when you really have no idea and then you just go on start looking at podcasts you're like oh god okay I don't have the time to kind of go through this and figure out what to listen to um I purely do it by recommendation um because I I just get bombarded it's too much um so I think it's cool that you're doing a pod about a pod because that would be something that someone like me could listen to and be like okay so this is what I want to listen to and I can get recommendations from that Thank you again to Beth Barron for coming on my podcast and sharing her thoughts and feelings about Nancy, and especially for those kind words at the end. Thank you, my friend. And as always, thank you for joining me on another episode in my quest to find the best of podcasts. You can follow A Pod About A Pod on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram to stay up to date with our latest projects. Email us at apodaboutapod at gmail.com with any feedback or suggestions for a show you think deserves a feature on APAAP. Our next episode will drop two weeks from today, which is Father's Day. Until then, happy listening.